Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 through 26. It's a little bit lengthy, but uh, let me encourage you, if you're physically able to stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning, as we look at uh, the scripture together. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, given more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Dear Heavenly Father, as we consider how to be the body and how to fight off the attacks and the disease that wants to make our body sick, Help us to hear you speak to our hearts about who you are and how you are so we will know more about who we are and how we are to be. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I titled this message, The Church Killers. Because in this passage, what we find are two attitudes that I believe today the enemy loves to use to drive division into the church. And I think we can all agree, or I think we can all agree, that since, especially since COVID, we have been encouraged to divide into camps, right? First it was, is COVID real or is it not, right? How many of you remember it was just a conspiracy? Yeah, and then people got sick and died and we didn't know what to do with that. Then it became, okay, well, is it... Uh, vaccine, not vaccine. And, and then it became distance, not distance. Close, not close. Wear your mask outside, don't wear it outside. And, and on and on it goes. And then it became, well, then you have to be in one of those two camps. And by the way, if you're not in my camp, you're evil. If you're not going to wear a mask, you just want to kill everybody. If you wear a mask, you're just being controlled by the government and they're lying to you and you're just buying the lie, right? I mean, it's just, it's gotten ridiculous. Now we're in election season. Do we even need to talk about the camps that we're dividing in over that? And so there, but in Paul's day, there were two key areas attacking the Corinthian church. He starts out in verse 14 with the reminder that we've seen for the last few weeks. As a matter of fact, some, somebody's probably gonna come up to me this week and say, it seems like you just preach the same message every week for the last three weeks, because that's what the scripture does. But look at verse 14. The body is not one member, but many. The body, not the bodies, is not one member, but many. Remember, we are different, but we are one. Think about that. Look around. Look around you. If you've not been with us before, this is not rhetorical. Look around. Well, I'm not going to go on until you look around. There are different people, right? How many husbands do we have? Raise your hand. How many of you are thankful that your wife is not like you? (laughs) Amen, amen. Uh, Because, first of all, if, if she was exactly like us, we would only need one of us, right? Second of all, if she was like us, oh, she's much prettier, right? Much better. How many, how many of us agree? How many of us husbands here agree we married above ourselves? All right. So you can thank me later for, for getting you out of the doghouse or, or getting you some points. 
But he, but he starts off with that reminder, we're different, but we're one. We have different personalities, yes. There are people that, um, let's just say there are some people in our lives for whom extra grace is required, right? Everybody knows a person like that, right? Yeah, don't point, that's just rude. Um, <laughs> but, but we all have those people in our lives for whom extra grace is required because their personality is so different than ours, right? How many of you tend to, just be honest, how many of you tend to be very positive? Yeah, you notice how quickly the hands went up? How many of you tend to be more negative? I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> Shut up, you jerk. Um, yeah, so, so we have different personalities. And some of those personalities, at times, if we're honest, and I know we're in church, so we're supposed to be fakely Christian. I don't agree with that, but anyway, we're supposed to give the right answers. But there are some people that just... I only have one nerve, and they get on that one, right? Uh, by the way, if you don't have anybody like that in your life, you probably are that person for someone else. <laughs> just, just saying. Remember, we're different, but we're one. And then he goes into this description in verses 15 through 17. Listen, I know we just read it, but listen to this. If the foot says... Because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. It's not for this reason any less a part of the body. Now, we see this repeated in 16. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. Now, first of all, that's a very Jewish way of saying something. When you say the exact same thing, but insert something differently in it. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Here's what I believe we see here is envy. Envy. The part of the body looks at another part of the body and says, I'm not important because I'm not them. I'm not as important as the Sunday school teachers, Bill Pratt or Bill Reese or uh, as uh, TJ was this morning or Chris when he's here or uh, some that teach the, the TJ, uh, Tyson and some that teach the children. I'm, I'm not as important as them because I'm not a Sunday school teacher. But here's the reality. God hasn't called you to that yet. He might, it's up to him. But it's easy sometimes for us to look at others and say, they've been given more gifts. They're more important. I don't have a place. And first of all, I believe that that's a lie. Straight from the pit of hell. Designed to keep followers of Jesus on the sidelines instead of in the game. Because here, here's the thing, if somebody else has been given gifts I haven't been given, then I can feel better about doing nothing, right? But you know what? Envy is a way of saying to God, God, your word says you're good, but you haven't been good to me. Now, we'd never say that, right? I mean, we know better. We'd never say that. But when we envy, when we look at somebody else's position and wish we were them, by the way, God felt so strongly about that that he put it in the Ten Commandments, right? Coveting your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's donkey, or that, that was all about envy. That's about wishing I had what somebody else has. But that's a way really of saying to God, God, you owe me. If you're going to be a good God, and if you're going to be a God who, who, who treats people justly and fairly, you haven't done my part, so bring it on. It's our way of really playing God. Now, don't get me wrong. We see things and, and our eyes want them. I get that. But this goes more to the person. We can talk about lust and, and that kind of stuff in a different message, but this is really looking at a person and saying, I wish I, wish I were them, or I wish I had what they have, or I wish I was in their position. In, in Paul's day in the church at Corinth, it was mainly about service in the church, right? So I have a behind, how many of you have a behind the scenes gift? Yeah, nobody's going to raise their hand because they're behind the scenes, right? There are some who are up front, there are some who are behind. But let's just be honest with each other and say, you know what, what church could survive without behind the scenes workers? I mean, let's face it, if everything in this church had to be done by the pastor, 
not a lot would get done. And certainly not a lot of different things would be done. Can you imagine if we all just had the gift of preaching? I know I said this a couple weeks ago. We would never go home. Right? Because we'd be like, okay, you're done, my turn. But while I'm preaching, we got people doing children's church and they're, they're teaching and we got kids, people watching smaller kids and, and they're taking care of them, nurturing them and trying to tell them the basics that there is a God and he made them and he loves them. While we've got technical minded people back behind me and in front of me that are, they're doing technical stuff so that we have lights and we have the ability to see on the screen and people can watch from afar and all those things going on all at the same time. So what we have is a compounded ministry and a diversified ministry. And I don't pretend to be very smart financially. We have those in the room who are. But I think compounding and diversification can be a good thing. Because if it's only up to just one, not much is going to get done. So to me, envy is something that can drive wedges into churches and can weaken them. There are those who think, I'm not eloquent, so I'm not needed. I'm uncertain, so I'm not needed. I don't have the position. I'm not a deacon. I'm not an elder. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I'm not a team leader. I'm not this. I'm not that. There are those who, who, who look at others with personalities and say, I wish I had that personality. There are some with education. I don't know why anyone would ever want to go to school longer than they had to. But there are some who have that, and there are some who look at that and say, well, well, because that person has that education, then they, they know, and I don't, and that makes me unimportant. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, and that's not true. I learn every single time I go to Sunday school. Some people look and say, well, that person has passion. I don't, I don't have much passion. I must not be needed. We all have passion. It may, not, it may be expressed in different ways. When I get passionate about something, when I get fired up about something, when something's burning in my bones and I just want to plug into you and let transfer it, you don't want to sit on the front row. Spit's flying, sweat's flying. It's, that's, my, that's the way I express passion, but it may be different for you. People think I don't have the money someone else has, so that makes me not important. I don't have the charisma that other people have, so I'm not important. On and on and on the list goes, and here's what I hear in that drum beat. The enemy saying, you are nothing. Here's what I hear the Lord say. I loved you enough to die for you. And you are a part of this body. And this body is going to operate properly as long as you are fulfilling your purpose. We need everybody. We need everybody. Do we have some who maybe give more than others? Maybe. I don't know who that is. I don't look at that stuff. I don't want to know. Do we have maybe some who serve more? in two or three or four ministries versus one? Maybe. Again, I'm still kind of learning that. But every single person is needed. And none of us need to look across the aisle or across the seat and think, gosh, if I was just them, I would be important in the kingdom. You are important in the kingdom. Why? Not because of you, but because of him who has saved you and gifted you and called you and plugged you into this place and kept you alive and given you breath and is ready for you to serve. So whenever you hear the enemy whisper into your ear, God hasn't done well enough for you. I don't recommend talking to the devil. I'm just going to let you know that. I don't recommend talking to the devil. There's some people who say, turn around, tell the devil, leave me alone. You know what? I'm getting to talk to the one who can make him leave me alone. Besides that, if I'm facing God, the worst the devil can do is bite me on the backside. 
So again, he comes back in verses 18 through 20 and, and repeats where he started. Remember, we're different, but we're one. Look at verse 18. Now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. Hmm, have we heard that before? Seems like we have. Um, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But there are many members, but one body. Do you hear that drum beat? One body, one body, one body, one body. But there's a second killer in this passage. And it's arrogance. Look at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body. You catch the, the first one, did you notice the foot says in verse 15, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. That's where envy comes in. But in this case, it's just the opposite. The eye says, to, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. That's what we saw in the video, right? The eye saying, I don't need the hand. If we're not careful, another way the enemy attacks us is by puffing us up. I am important. Everybody better listen to me. And if people will just do it my way, this place would be a whole lot better. Or, like when I used to play football, if you want to win, give me the ball. There's that attitude. It's arrogance. The word for arrogance in the Greek language, I love. I mean, I hate it, but I love it. Literally means to sit on top of a wall and look down. So to be arrogant thinks, I am all that, and y'all are nothing. Now, we wouldn't ever say it that way, right? I mean, TJ would, TJ's never playing and singing going, I'm the only one that gets to play the guitar. I sing, and people have to sing along. They put the words on the screen. I make them sing what I want to sing, and that's the way I do things here. He doesn't, I don't think so anyway. <laughs> Maybe he does, but I don't think so. But <laughs> it would be really easy. It'd be really easy in a, in a moment of weakness for someone to question TJ. And for the response to be, look, I am here. I lead worship. You don't. Shut up and go away. Now, again, I don't think TJ would do that, but that's what this is talking about. You know, it's, it's the person in church that says, well, if that's how you're going to spend the money, then I'm going to keep my tithe. I know none of us would do that. But it's that way that says, I have the best ideas. Y'all just need to go along with it. It's an arrogance that says, I don't need you. Can I tell you a little secret? Many of you know this about me already. And some that were here when we had the luncheon when I first came heard this. But, you know, my personality is more like, um, let's just jump. And then as I'm falling off the side of the cliff, look around and say, anybody bring a parachute? <laughs> my wife's personality, on the other hand, is... Let's not only buy the parachute, let's unpack the parachute, make sure it's good, repack the parachute, unpack it again to make sure that it was packed correctly, then pack it again, and then, and then put it in the car, and then go out and check to make sure it's still in the car. The difference is, she's never going to jump. <laughs> now, it's easy for me to say, we got to get stuff done. We can't be spending all our time just planning. But that's arrogance. 
because that's saying what you contribute to our family or to the situation is not needed. Now, she could say the same thing about me. She could say, how many times have I had to bring your clothes for baptism because you didn't bring them? We got in the tank in my last church. Or how many times did you need this or need that or had to go to the store on a mission trip or had to do this because you didn't plan, you didn't pack. See, we need each other. We need each other. Sometimes we need people around us who can smooth over the way we rub people wrong. Sometimes we need people around us who can say a kind word when we have spoken harshly. Sometimes we need people around us to help us because it's so easy for the enemy to whisper into our ears that we have the answers. We can, just think about this, we can become arrogant in our politics. We can become arrogant with our money, with our education, with our abilities, with our gifts, with our passions. All those same things that we can envy, we can also become arrogant. We can become arrogant in our theological positions. We can become arrogant. We've retired. We're the important people now. Or we work. We're the important people now. We can become arrogant in that we know exactly what the church office should be doing and they're not doing it. They better do what we tell them. But here's what happens when, and, and you know this, right? How many of you have ever been around somebody who was arrogant? Does that feel good? Do you just feel like throwing your arm around their shoulder and singing kumbaya and swaying back and forth around a campfire? Oh, you're thinking about fire, all right. And you're thinking about your arm and their body, but maybe not in the same way. Maybe a headlock or throat punch, I don't know. But, but here's the thing. When the enemy whispers into our ear and raises us up, and we see everybody else is down, what we've done is fallen into his trap, which we've become God. That's what he did. He didn't like the idea that there would be a creation that would worship God and be redeemed by his son. He said, I want that attention. So what did he do? He said, I will make my throne above God's throne. And when we get arrogant, it opens us up to things like judging each other assuming we know what's in one another's hearts. You know, it's an interesting thing. You walk into a bar on a Friday night and see two drunk guys sitting on a stool at the bar. You don't know that one of them has been on the wagon for six years and his wife just died and it was too much stress and he gave in to the temptation. The other guy is there every single night in that same condition with no remorse. You can't tell the difference between the two. And so what do we do? In our arrogance, we judge. And we say, oh, he's just a drunk. We, in our arrogance, tend to judge other people's actions while we want God to give us credit for our intentions. And that destroys the church. It destroys the church. And that's what Paul was writing to. Now, how do you avoid these killers? You know, we have a lot of scary movies. I don't like to watch them and I don't recommend them for anybody. There are lots of scary movies where the guy, you know, there's some guy, deranged person with a, a lethal weapon walking around chasing people. And I just, the, the few times I've ever seen a movie like that, I want to say, run the other way. Don't, don't go walking down the hallway with the flashing overhead light that can't stay lit. Okay, if I ever walk down a hallway and that's going on, I'm out. 
I'm telling you, if I was in a scary movie, it would be that long. I mean, I hear, it. oh. So how do we avoid those killers? Well, we're given the, the key, I think, in the passage in, these, in a verse and a half. But that the members may have the same care for one another. Care for each other. Do you know it's really hard to judge one another and assign value to people's lives if you care for them? Did you know that? Now, we have to understand the word care here doesn't mean have a emotional, positive draw. To care for them means to serve them. It's a related word. Serve them. You know what happens when you're serving somebody? You get to hear their story, don't you? Everybody's got a story. And it's really hard to hate somebody when you hear their story. So care for each other. Take that time to build that relationship to do for others what they need. See, it's it's real hard to feel arrogant when you're serving. That's why Jesus washed the disciples' feet that night and told them to wash each other's feet. It's also hard to envy when you're pouring yourself into someone's life and hearing their story because here's the reality. We all come to church and we look around this room and we think I'm the only one with issues. All these people are perfect. And can I tell you a little secret? We're all messed up. So care for each other. Two, suffer together. Suffer together. You know, when someone loses a family member, there's that initial time of what's going on? How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? How's it going? To to the point where they get sick of hearing, are you okay? Because we just want to say, no, of course not. Quit asking. But then they really want you to keep asking. But then after a while, what happens is we go back to life. And they're still trying to figure out how to live that life that all of a sudden has been thrust on them. And that's where as a church, I think we have to have relationships so that I can look and see someone struggling. Where I can look and see someone's having a bad day. They may have said something sharp to me, and I may want to get my hackles up and be, be all, ah. And I realize, wait a minute, that's not how this person normally is. What else is going on? Because we, we do a good job of masking our tears at times. But suffer together. You know, church should be the one place that someone can come to and say, I'm not okay. But sadly, if we're not careful, that's the place we're least likely to say that. Because we're afraid. We're afraid somebody will judge us. Or you don't have enough faith. You don't love Jesus enough. You don't trust God. And I... And I can tell you in in all the loss we suffered in a short amount of time, I trusted God, but that didn't mean that day didn't stink. And in that sorrow, we often pull into ourselves, which is the time we need each other the most. But if I don't know you, Like just looking at faces here today, I'm looking and I'm starting to learn stories. And I know a few, but for the most part, you could be having the worst day you've ever had and I wouldn't know. Now, if you come and tell me, then I can pray for you and with you and suffer with you. But that only happens if I'm not arrogant thinking I have the answers because you're not going to approach that guy or I'm not envious because then I'll stay disengaged. And by the way, that's not just for me. It's for all of us, but it starts with me. And lastly, look at verse, the last of verse 26. 
he says, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. We just covered that. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. So we need to care for each other, suffer together, and rejoice together. Now, again, this is one of the things that I think we do a little better of, right? How many of you had something good happen this week? Raise your hands real high, real high. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. That's awesome. Love that. We ought to rejoice together, right? But here's the thing. I'm afraid if I tell somebody something good happened, they're going to think I'm bragging. I lost five pounds this week. Yeah. Don't laugh. And don't tell me how much I got to go. Anybody else? What, what was something good? Audience participation. Somebody want to say, what's something good? I got a new class of students. You got a new class of students. Yay! <laughs> now, I, just so I understand why that's such a good thing, is that because you got rid of the old group? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, she got a new class of students. Here's the amazing part. You ready for this? This is the good part for me. You're excited about it. Yeah. Some people be like, <laughs> I got a new class of students. <laughs> Went down to fifth grade after teaching middle school for 15 years. Wow, yeah, that's awesome. I almost did that too. I almost went back from sixth grade to fifth grade, but that's a different story. <laughs> that's awesome. See, we need to be telling each other these good things, right? So we can rejoice together. See, if I'm arrogant, I won't listen to your story. Right? If I'm envious, I don't want to hear it because it's going to make me feel worse. But we ought to rejoice together. I don't want to share any names, but we have somebody getting married pretty soon. We ought to rejoice with that, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So how do we avoid these two killers? We care for each other, suffer together, and rejoice together. So these church killers can strike at any time. How can we, before we have this opportunity, how can we protect ourselves? Number one, pray for each other. I'm going to challenge you to do something. Now, here's the great thing about being a preacher. I can ask you to do it. I have no power over whether you do or not. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to find a person in this church, get their name, and set an alarm on your phone or reminder to pray for that person every day. Now, here's, here's what you're going to do. Here's, look, some of y'all just did it. You looked at each other and went, we're married, you're it. <laughs> but let me encourage you to think about, think about, look around the room. Find somebody you don't know well. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going you're to do this for a little bit, and then you're going to run out of stuff to pray for. You know what that's going to require? You to go back to them and say, what's going on? How can I pray for you? And that's caring for each other. It might result in suffering together, and it might rejoice, rejoicing together. So pray for each other. But we, t we also have to know each other. Right? I mean, I know I'm the new guy, and you guys know each other. But do you? In our area, we live in gated communities. We distance ourselves. We close our doors. We stay inside. How much do we really know each other? See, the easiest way to fight against envy and arrogance is when I know you, I know that you and I are the same. No, we may have different personalities and gifts and experiences and all that stuff, but we're the same. We are sinners saved by grace. 
And even though we're saved, we still struggle every single day to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We know it's God who works in us, even making us want to. And we're all looking forward to the day when Jesus says, it's time to come home. So we're the same. But we have to know each other. We also have to serve each other. That comes in that caring for each other part. But here, I need to pray, I need to know. Once I know, then I can serve. If I don't know, if I know Kathy is needing help moving some furniture, now I can make a choice, right? Will I go help? But if I don't know, I can't serve. But once I have the knowledge, then I have to choose. It's so easy, and we've been taught in our world to just stay back and don't get involved because if I know nothing, I can do nothing. But that's not how a church works. We have to love each other. I know that's kind of a nebulous thing, and we hear it thrown around in church a lot, and Jesus said that was the greatest commandment. But what does it mean to love each other? Well, if we're going to love like God does, we have to be willing to sacrifice for one another. We have to be willing to give of ourselves, expecting nothing in return. You know what I find when we do that? We get much more than we give. Think about it. When's the last time you helped somebody? Didn't you feel good? Didn't you feel good? We need to serve each other, love each other. We need to be together. We need to be together. One of the challenges, I'm just going to be honest, one of the challenges for me in this church from where I came to here is I only see most of you once a week. That's not enough for me. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to say we're going to go to multiple services and all that kind of stuff. That's not my point. I just, we need to be together. We need to serve together. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip together? You know, you come away from those trips with these inside jokes, right? You remember the time when so-and-so fell asleep, we decorated their face with permanent markers? <laughs> well, maybe that was me. Um, or you remember when we picked, I remember this story. So we were in Haiti and we were renovating a kitchen for the missionary and she had these crates that you kept uh, glass pop bottles in. And it was empty. And so I'm going to move it and so we can work on the kitchen. And I pick it up, and there is a spider in each one of those little holes this big. I threw the crate and spiders everywhere while screaming like a small child and tripping and almost falling down the stairs to get away from it because I hate spiders, especially big spiders that have conversations about whether they're going to eat me here or take me home. So we come away serving together. We come away with these shared funny stories, but we also come back with an appreciation for the gifts and talents God's poured into each one of us. My, my job when I go on mission trips is anything no one else wants to do. Why? Because there's not a lot I can do. You know, I, I struggle to nail two boards together. Now, you, you want something destroyed? I'm your man but I don't have any carpentry skills. I don't have any masonry skills. I, don't, I, don't ha I can't build tables. I can't build cabinets. I can't do all that stuff. But you know what I can do? I can swing a mean broom. Or, a, or I can swab the deck. Been there, done that. I can clean your toilet. I can carry the toilet we're changing down four flights of stairs and go put it in the dumpster. I can go down those same four flights of stairs and get you the screwdriver that you forgot to take up to the fourth floor with you. But, but I learned to appreciate those who did and had those skills and can do those things. Serving together helps us to know each other, helps us to know how to serve each other. So the question becomes, 
But what if I'm already under attack by one of these killers? What if I already find myself envying others or feeling arrogant? What do I do? Well, first of all, pray and tell God about it. We call that confession. It doesn't happen in a room with a black curtain sitting between two booths. It happens when we talk to the God of the universe. And by the way, the word confess means to agree. Con means together or connected. Fess means to speak, speak together, agree with God about what he already knows. When we, tell our, when we confess our sins to God, he's not going, what? He's saying, yeah, I saw the whole thing. So pray and talk to God about it. And then step up to help. Step in, get in the game. Serve with someone. Come to someone and say, you know what? I, I'm not a Sunday school teacher, but, but, but I'll help you. You need somebody to be in the class to take attendance? I can do that. You want someone to organize a, a, a social a get-together? I'm your person. But ask me to explain infralapsarianism? I'm out. Serve with someone. Step up. Get in the game. But all of that suggests a few basic questions. Number one, are you part of his body? Because all these things we're talking about are all behaviors or actions or things we can do. But if we're not a part of the body, we're going to run out of juice really quick. Are you a part of the body? Well, what do you mean by that? Are you a follower of Jesus? I, I, I like to say it that way. I know a lot of times we'd ask somebody, are you a Christian? But in our nation, we've kind of started to equate being American with Christian. Even though originally in Antioch, Christian was a term meant to make fun of followers of Christ because Christian means little Christ. And as a way of saying, hey, we killed him. You're acting like him. Straighten up or we'll kill you. But in our day, we throw Christian on everything. It's become a cultural thing instead of a relationship thing. Are you a follower of Jesus? Here's, here's the way I know. The only way I really know I'm a follower of Jesus is if I'm following Jesus. Now, do I believe once a person is truly saved, they're always saved? Of course I believe that. But there are a lot of people that express interest in Jesus and walk away because I did. Are you following Jesus? Are you a member of a church? It's real easy to be a, an attender and sit on the sidelines. But what I'm talking about, the kind of relationships we're talking about be, be, get built when you're committed together. Are you serving in the church that you are a member of? So I, I said this a few weeks ago, and I really believe this with all my heart, that the, the biblical description of a Christian in the first century was somebody who comes to some type of smaller group of discipleship, someone who attends the larger group for worship, and someone who serves in at least one ministry. Are you serving? Do you love and pray for the church that you're a part of. Can I share some good news with you? These killers don't have to kill anybody. Envy and arrogance are both destroyed when we realize we're sinners in need of a Savior. Some of us have made that decision to follow Jesus already, but some here today may need to. And we want to invite you to come and ask how that can be true for you today. But you know what? There are also some folks here that are followers of Jesus, and for whatever reason, you're just not plugged in. You're not, you're not a, you, you, you attend church, but maybe you're not a member of the church. And at this point, I'm so new, I don't know who that is. But maybe what God's saying to you this morning is if this church is going to try to live like Paul told Corinth, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. And we're going to invite you to come in just a few moments too and just take somebody by the hand and say, I want to be a part of this church. What's the next step for me? 
But you know what? You may also be here in some of what I've described today. Maybe you are that hurting person. Maybe you are that struggling person. And you just need someone to suffer with you. We want to invite you to, to come and say, would you pray for me? I'm gonna, I'll have the elders come join me at, here at the front and you can come take any one of us by the hand and just say, would you pray for me? I'm struggling. Let's pray. Your Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning. We thank you that you've warned us about these attitudes that can divide and destroy your church. Father, we pray that you would help us to turn away from those attitudes, that we would see ourselves as you do, saved and holy and righteous and blameless and seated in the heavenlies, even though we haven't experienced that yet. Father, help us to desire relationship with each other and relationship with you. Father, we pray that if any are here this morning that need to become part of your body, we pray that you draw them this morning, draw them to salvation, draw them to become part of this church, whatever it is that you want to do. Father, we pray, we know you've been moving. Give us feet to our faith. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're physically able to...